Anyway, um, uh, so anyway, I wanted to just uh, point out to you, so um, our sponsor, we have our host and we have our sponsor, Elias. Elias is very keen on this book, Miracles by C.S. Lewis. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, C.S. Lewis and how he comes into it. Actually, interesting, just hearing Andrew's talk, I, there's actually quite a strong resonance with a number of the ideas, and of course Lewis was writing this 60 years ago. Um, anyway, so some of, who do, do you know who Lewis, uh, people may or may not know who Lewis is. People probably know him from his Chronicles of Narnia. Um, so these were written actually towards the end of his career a bit, 50, it's way down here, 56, 50, 56, Lion, Witch and the Wardrobe. But, um, so he's known as a fantasy writer, and he was a very close friend of Tolkien. They were contemporaries here in Oxford at the same time, and they had a you know, uh, their little club, which they used to meet and uh, drink together and discuss ideas, maybe somewhere to go for your uh, pint after the uh, meeting. It's on the way back to the station, so you might like to call in there. Anyway, so in addition to this, um, both of these were very strong Christian thinkers, and through their writings, they tried to discuss topics of, you know, so, um, relate. they were, op well, Lewis is very openly Christian in his writings, in a number of, of his works. Anyway, so the one I'm going to look at, looking at here, is miracles. You say, well, where on earth does this, what's the place of a book on miracles in a book, or in a discussion on science, the limits of science, where sci what science is. So anyway, I'll try and explain that to you, how it fits in. Um, so anyway, he's a Christian apologist, and he's obviously trying to get, ultimately, to explain things which Christians believe. So Christians believe in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, God becoming flesh. This is not the sort of thing that happens in ordinary science. So this is a miracle. So Christians believe in miracles, and that's where he's trying to get to. He's trying to say it is not unreasonable to think uh, such a thing can have occurred. Um, and there is a long history to this, um, especially in Britain here. We have the empirical, empiricist philosophers, um, perhaps starting with Hume, and Hume famously tried to prove that miracles cannot happen. And it's basically based on, essentially, laws of uh, probability. They say, well, you have the laws of science. These, we have extremely good evidence that these apply, uh, many experiences of them. And then we have this, someone's claiming a miracle. Uh, and this is, happens very rarely. And it's, the evidence for it is weak, he would argue, and say, so any rational person has to believe that miracles can't happen. Um, well, Lewis does try to respond to that um, statement of Hume, and that comes towards the end of his book. Anyway, that's not what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to focus um, on the, uh, the start of the talk, um, where he's essentially trying, at these early chapters here, he's trying to define what nature, natural science is, what it can tell you, what it can't tell you. Okay, and so um, this is where it's actually interesting in the context of this meeting here today. So um, he starts by um, talking about, he sort of divides, divides the world into two types of people, um, naturalists and supernaturalists. Okay, and so I'm going to explain to explain these um, uh, here. So this side, by the way, I believe this is, this is a TV program. I've never seen it. It's on to... Uh, 300 plus episodes. Um, this is a, a, a pop album, I believe. Um, anyway, what is a naturalist? So, um, a naturalist is someone who thinks that nothing but nature exists. The word nature means for, to him merely everything, or the whole show, or whatever there is. And if that is what we mean by nature, then of course nothing else exists. So, basically, it's a statement saying, well, we have natural science, and that effectively explains everything we can possibly know. Um, many scientists think this way, so um, obviously the alternative of this is going to believe there are things outside in the, uni in the universe. There are things outside of natural science. Perhaps this is perhaps mystery in Andrew's language. Uh, but for example, we know the arch naturalist probably would be someone like Richard Dawkins. I spotted at uh, Paddington Station this morning. Dawkins has got a new book out. I um, haven't read it yet, but anyway. Uh, the hypothesis of God offers no worthwhile explanation for anything. 
the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at the bottom no design, no purpose, no evil and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. So this is an attitude I think we are familiar with. People would say that essentially science gives the last word. You know, it may not be able to answer a particular problem right now. Well, that's essentially an unanswerable problem then, isn't it? Maybe times to come it will give an answer, but right now there's no point asking if this is the only reliable knowledge thinking process we've got. Um, so there's a key idea here is that science goes on of its own. And it's kind of, you know, I didn't realize this, only reading uh, Lewis I discovered this, what the, these words actually mean. So um, Greek word for nephysis is the Greek word for nature, and it's connected with growing. Likewise, nature is essentially a Latin word. It comes from the verb to be born, you know, natal in English. Um, you know, natal, it's all to do with being born. And of course, we think the natural world that's out there, trees and things that grow. And in general, it's um, things that, you know, self-replicating doesn't need anything to go on. It will self-go uh, on its own. And it's, He's, of course, applying this on a bigger scale. The whole process of nature, the universe, the thinking system, the laws of nature, they just go on their own. They explain themselves, essentially. And, of course, you know, you will find uh, books on the self-creating universe. The universe creates itself. Um, okay, now, interestingly enough, I thought to myself, well, uh, if you want to find out what nature and naturalist means, well, perhaps I, the guys who publish nature should know what nature is. <laughs> and uh, what the word natural is. Uh, very interesting. So this is, if you look on the history of, from nature's own web page, it talks about how they came up with the idea of uh, nature for the journal. And actually I found this interesting. Um, so this is, a, what a glorious title, nature. This is 1869. A veritable stroke of genius to have hit upon it. There's more than cosmos, more than universe. It includes the seen as well as the unseen, the possible as well as the actual nature. Nature's God, mind and matter. I'm lost in admiration of the effulgent blaze of ideas it calls forth. So it's interesting. These guys who started the journal Nature clearly were not naturalists by um, Lewis's definition. They saw there was more in the universe than just um, physical laws. Um, now, by contrast, what is a supernaturalist? Okay, so this is a a definition I found of the word supernatural in um, this was from an Oxford reference to it's attributed thought to reveal some force above uh, the laws of nature magical occult mystical um, okay mystery we just had a minute ago anyway so here we have an example of some supernatural event here is a, a student flying on a broomstick okay now um, I do cannot give any scientific explanation from how it happens, but obviously it happens. You there the evidence in front of your eyes. So some supernatural event, possibly called magic, has made this happen. Um, but we cannot explain this within the ordinary laws of physics. Okay. Anyway, so this is uh, Lewis's definition of what a supernaturalist is. Uh, something, there's something that goes super beyond nature. Um, supernatural thinks that things fall into two classes, and the first class find either things or more probably one thing which is basic and original which exists on its own the second we in the second we find things that are merely derivative from that one thing the one basic thing has caused the other things to be it exists on its own they exist because it exists so the naturalists think nature exists on its own it self supporting the supernaturalist is obviously someone who basically believes in a creator god um, believes that all every Nature exists, it's underpinned by, well, mystery in Andrew's words, perhaps, or um, anyway, those, um, these were Lewis's words. I would also point out, for those who theologians around, he's not using supernatural in a theological sense of the word. It's not, got nothing whatsoever to do with indwelling of the Holy Spirit and this kind of thing. It's purely, do you believe there is more out there than they are? You, are you a total, it's basically an atheist, contrasting a scientific atheist like Dawkins and someone who believes in a creator God working through nature. Okay, now um, this is a crux of the argument which it sort of comes in through um, in the third chapter and he's basically asking uh, whether you know, the natural scientific process can uh, explain uh, human thought, the reasoning process. 
um, which I think was the sort of n mysteries at the top Andrew had in his talk. Uh, one thing you'll find, by the way, is that this book has um, uh, originally published in 1947. It was revised in 1960. I was interested to find out which bits were revised. As far as I can see, the, one of the main revisions was in this third chapter, which was originally called The Self-Contradiction of the Naturalist. That title got softened a bit to the cardinal difficulty. So he's reduced it from being a, a self-contradiction to a difficulty. Obviously, somebody's criticised his argument, so it's not quite as convincing as you, you're claiming it to be. Um, but anyway, obviously, within um, a naturalist approach to the universe, you have to say, well, thought, reasoning, free will, all of these things must be accounted for by some scientific um, a process which sort of would ultimately operate through the laws of physics. I mean, I suppose it's the problem about, you know, does the, each way you say, well, ultimately we say, well, are you a lump of atoms obeying quantum physics? Ultimately, that's all you are. Um, this is the ultimate reductionist approach, which Andrew is trying to argue against in the previous talk. Um, but if you do take it away, you do probably end up coming to this kind of conclusion. And ultimately, your thinking has to be explained within that self-consistent natural process. And he argues that the answer it cannot be. Now, don't really have time to do it. You're going to get copies of this book, so you can go away and read it, see if you find chapter 3 convincing. It's a sort of crux of the whole book, in a way. Um, anyway, now I, don't, I have to throw this one in, because I think this is a, an answer to our chair, uh, Professor Swallows, who um, he does throw in a small comment about quantum physics and its development. Of course, he's writing this in 1947, where the ideas are not so well developed. Um, but anyway, he talks about some modern scientists seem to think that individual units of matter uh, moves in an indeterminate or random fashion, moves on its own in its own accord. I think, in a way, Lewis isn't really understood it properly here. To say that it's moving on its own doesn't mean it's got a free will. It's deciding in its own way. Um, but anyway, he seems to, and I think these, this is now, modern science has shown that if this is this sort of actual attitude here. There's no sort of deep underlying free will, though some people seem to think there is. And he s says, you know, ultimately this opens a little door to, um, you know, uh, what he calls it a subnatural door. So he opens the back door opening on the subnatural is quite on the cards, they make an open door on the supernatural. Um, so he's contrary to something. Well, there are people who think this. You know, for example, Roger Penrose um, is a leading exponent in some ways. He thinks that somehow quantum physics can explain consciousness. Um, and uh, he's written a number of books. But you'll find umpteen books on quantum consciousness out there. Um, Lewis is saying that this is some, he's calling this is some subnatural. It's not going to explain these supernatural phenomena. And I think. His explanation there is probably outdated. You don't want to read too much into it. Anyway, say, super, um, nature and super. It is, of course, possible to suppose that when all the atoms of the universe got into a certain relation, which they're bound to get into sooner or later, you know, this is the law of probabilities, um, there would be some state which would eventually become conscious um, in that kind of sense. But he says this cosmic mind would be just as much as its own mind the product of a mindless nature. So, you know, you could get, uh, theoretically, by some random process, a whole con conglomeration of atoms which would self-organize themselves into a grey matter that would somehow produce some random, you know, might bleat out um, Shakespeare or something like this. But it's kind of a random. It's an unthinking uh, it's not under understanding the rational process. It's not appreciating what it's saying. It's mindless. Um, so lastly, miracles. Where do these fit in? This is where he's trying to... Obviously, miracles are infringements of the laws of nature. They're sort of, um, sort of things that somehow cannot be explained. Um, so what is a law of nature that they're going to infringe? He argues there are three types. Um, when you say a law of nature... It's a brute fact. Um, I'd like to say, one thing I'd say is, is um, explaining by naming is an interesting thing. A brute fact. It doesn't say, you know, you observe something in the lab and you record it. And then somebody else, um, and you publish your paper recording it, somebody else observes the same thing and says, 
aha, that's the Fox effect, as explained in that paper by Fox. Now, as it turns out, of course, Fox didn't give an explanation. Um, I just reported what I would observe. So I'm just, somebody else says, I know what's happening. It's that thing that Fox observed. Um, but Fox didn't give an explanation. So you haven't explained anything, actually. You're just, um, you're just recording facts and saying, well, this is what seems to happen. Um, another is laws of averages. Now, this is sort of getting closer to what we would understand in terms of modern quantum physics, that many times, you know, you fire that, that photon at that beam splitter, and half the time it goes one way, and half the time you can't predict which way it goes, but you can predict the probability. Um, then uh, this is the necessary truth. So I think he's getting close towards some of the Andrew's thinking on this, um, some of his symmetry ideas. They are perennial, these laws of mathematics, sort of their necessary truths, like truths of mathematics. So like, um, obviously, conservation of momentum in the billiard ball example. Um, this is obviously based on underlying symmetries, which are there. Um, now, what a miracle is going to do is there's going to be something else thrown into the equations. It's sort of cheating. It's changing some little scenario. Once that's happened, everything else that follows from it um, follows the ordinary laws of physics, but somehow you just come in and tweak things. You do something differently, and of course you get a different result. So obviously if you fire the billiard ball at this thing, you're not going to get the standard result. So somebody's come in and cheated, really. So a miracle is uh, view of a form of doctoring, tampering, cheating. Um, so you create a new situation, totally outside the ordinary system, and then from then onwards, um, it has to evolve according to the normal scientific process, but that tampering, that has to be done from something outside of the whole natural system. It can't happen from within it. It's, by definition, it's not a miracle, and obviously he is a Christian, and he's trying to argue that miracles have happened through extra uh, supernatural influences. Um, so causality discusses, this is a very interesting statement, I think. Um, uh, it's probably really clear what the laws of nature really are. We are in the habit of talking as if they caused events to happen. You know, why did this happen? Oh, that happened because of, I can explain this because of my law of physics. You know, I fired that billiard ball and this other one went that way. So I now ex I can explain to you why that ball went over there. It's because it was hit by the first ball moving in this direction at a certain speed and so on. So I've explained it. I can give you that. But actually, you haven't. Um, really explained. You didn't explain why the ball, the first ball, was going in that direction in the first place. That's because I got my little cue out and I gave it a pelt and it went that way. In my case, not, undoubtedly not in the wrong direction for what I intended it to go. But um, anyway, so they've never, um, as if they caused events to happen, they have never caused event, any event at all. The laws of motion do not set billiard balls moving. They analyze the motion after something else, say a man with a cue or a lurch of the uh, liner, or perhaps supernatural have provided. They produce, they produce no events. The science doesn't actually cause anything. It cannot, you know, you've got yourself explaining universe. Well, it doesn't explain any of the events in the universe. It just tells you what will happen um, as the, the universe evolves, assuming you've got a universe in the first place. You know, it doesn't explain any of these things. Um, so in the sense, laws of nature, the whole space and time, you know, they leave out precisely the whole real universe. They can't explain. I think this was your Andrew's bridge um, sort of floating in space. You know, you can see how the bridge completely supports itself, but it doesn't explain how on earth this bridge is floating in space. I don't know if that was the point you made. That's why I understood by seeing your picture. Um, anyway, so... This is my final slide. I kind of like this, you know. Um, uh, God said Maxwell's equations, and there was light. Because of course, Maxwell's equations say light. Well, of course, Andrew will say, well, uh, uh, Lorentz covariance. God said Lorentz covariance, and a few other things, and hence we get this, and hence there is light. But ultimately, you do need, we don't, these are these laws of nature, and we know and love them, and we use them all the time, and uh, we learn them at in our uh, lecture courses and so on, and we calculate things from them. We never really explain, we can always explain them in terms of 
we go back, you know, so, oh, this is good. Oh, well, there's Lorentz. We can now explain them in Lorentz covariance. Well, where does Lorentz covariance come from? You know, you, you sort of, you never quite, ultimately, you just have to say, well, that is there, and it's, it's a property, it's there, it's some symmetry or whatever. But I don't actually explain where it came from, and so this is why we need this. He, Lewis would argue we need this super, something is supernatural beyond nature. And that's why he goes on with his arguments. But anyway, you can hopefully all get yourself a copy and read it and uh, see what you make of it yourselves. Now, I find it interesting he was saying all these things 60 years ago, and some of it is a bit dated, but some of the arguments, I think, are still very valid. So anyway, that's all I'm... Oh yes, of course, definitely. I mean, he's the whole. I mean, he's trying to get get to the point of saying, you know, how can a, a, a modern thinking man believe in, you know, a virgin birth, for example? You know, this is absolute nonsense, isn't it, from any scientific point of view? But how can a how can it don't make any sense that a reasonable man can think this and he's he's trying to that's goes through at the end a few key miracles and explains why he thinks it's reason very reasonable to believe in these but you don't those of you who are out there if you don't want I think you should analyze the first chapters first because he's trying to set up the problem trying to say what is nature what is natural science what can it can it explain what can't it explain um, which I, th I think in some ways is Andrew's argument, but maybe he's about to comment and say that isn't yeah. his argument. No, um, I had a comment on another matter, but I will add a comment on that since you ask. Uh, I noticed that you made a reference to Roger Penrose, uh -huh. which I think is a good thing to do. I think he, he writes intelligently and insightfully about the nature of the reasoning process and whether it can be captured by ordinary computer science types of ideas, and he argues that it cannot. Mm -hmm. I think he makes a good argument. Mm -hmm. On the same sort of visual, though, you also had another book uh, oh. by an author of... I I've never, no, I have no idea what that book is. I says. saw the name was something along the lines of quantum consciousness. I wanted just to make sure everyone's aware that there's a large lot of nonsense oh, also yeah. written yeah. on that subject. So you just need to pick your author. Yeah, no, I was not advocate. I think yeah, I, no. I would say they are nonsense yeah, myself. Yeah, yeah. But so fine. Yeah, <laughs> coming, but I think I won't comment. But other than I also found Lewis's book on miracles to be very helpful. Mm. I personally just loved it and read it. But I subsequently found out that most people find it hard going. It so is. you know, do persevere though if you if you do read it. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask you if uh, for your opinion and also the opinion of uh, Lewis, uh, for example, in these lies. For me, the amazing miracle uh, are those four equations, not the, a possible violation of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, he, about he's, that. he's trying to, um, yeah, OK. Because so really, for me, it's amazing that there exists some rules. I find that's very uh, amazing. Yeah, well, I think that he's trying to explain. You said once he has this idea of nature as it self-supports itself, it, it goes on on its own, but it's, it's a to do that, it, you have to assume you have all these laws. He isn't really, really asking where the laws of science and physics come from. That's not particularly the question he's asking in this book. I don't know if he really tackles that elsewhere. I mean, that's in a sense, I've thrown that up. Um, it's an obvious question to ask. What he is saying is, he is trying to explain things like, his argument starting, can I explain rational thought, free will, these sort of arguments within uh, the context and with this sort of completely um, within the natural process, all the thinking, and it's sort of taking for granted these natural, he's sort of saying, well, a scientist will obviously they accept their natural laws. Can they explain everything with them? Which I think was Andrew's point at the top of his thing, you know, he gets to things that he sort of supports and etc., but it doesn't explain. Um, and I kind of but what the previous slide, I think, is kind of interesting. This one here, he says, actually, science, in some sense, doesn't explain anything. It sort of gives an account of what's going on in terms of some previous thing. But, you know, the, it does, you know logically, it doesn't 
get really back to the why, why, why does this actually happen? And at some point you say, well, that, well, we always use it all the time. Well, blah, 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 because you know, of Newton's laws. Well, we understand these are in terms of some more basic principle, but you still don't explain where that basic principle comes from, which possibly comes back to the question about mathematics. You know, where do these, you know, the, where does mathematics come from? Is it a, it's all part of the rational process. Okay, last question before the break. Uh, say we, well, since we haven't, I haven't read, I don't think any of us read the book yet, so say we assume Lewis' argument of, about the naturalist is right. Mm -hmm. Did he ever gave any argument as to then why Christianity is the best option? Um, yeah, obviously, he will argue. He is a Christian yeah. thinker. I know he would argue that um, you know, there is a sort of difference. They, part of it is he makes the point that Christianity makes one claim, which I suspect no other religion makes, you know, that God becomes man, um, which other religions do not claim in that sense. And that is a, you know, and then you have the, the, the word of God is in, in the world and can speak and so on. That is a claim that Christians make. And he's trying, he gets to that point at about chapter 15 in this book. You know, this is the, he calls it the central miracle. And he tries to argue why it, it is, but if we start off with he's saying, it's not unreasonable to say, to say that this could have happened. You know, he doesn't, ultimately you have to make a leap of faith, you know. But he says, is it utterly illogical, irrational to think, believe that such a thing could have happened? I think is, that's the question he's answering in this book. He has other books where he's trying to argue the case, but ultimately you'll never, you have to make a leap of faith at, faith at some point. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I would say we, we could go to the break. But before thanking all the speakers this session, and uh, you have to say something. Yes.